Good evening. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. So I have a slightly different uh, take on uh, this issue. So I know the council's uh, focusing on this 34%, uh, but as a building owner, uh, it's actually a little bit different than that. Uh, the pressure points for us is really uh, what the banks will lend against, what the insurance companies will accept, and what the tenants will accept. So it's almost a perfect storm, really, from a building owner's point of view, because this legislation came out. Uh, the banks panicked, and they seemed to pick this number of 65% as being the threshold that they were comfortable with. And if you had one under that, you suddenly had a bit of a problem, a big problem. Uh, they then called in the valuers, valuers who were still reeling from uh, the global meltdown and getting slapped around a little bit by everybody about how they came up with these valuations. Uh, they were called in and they took a very uh, conservative approach on building values. Um, and then you had tenants and a, a lot of tenants um, if they were banks or big um, insurance companies of, or that nature, they just decided they they could accept nothing less than really 100% because they couldn't be seen to putting their tenants at risk. So from a building owner's point of view, while you've got the council breathing down your neck over this 34%, the bigger issue, unless you're freehold and uh, you're not dealing with insurance companies, uh, is more like the 65%. So what I found, I, I had quite a number of buildings that uh, I've had to deal with um, ranging in sizes, is that uh, councils were given a very short period of time, and my experience is mostly in Auckland, uh, to a, do an assessment of these uh, buildings. And often they never even actually went into the buildings, they pretty much just drove by and said that'll be 34 or that'll be 55 based on what they could see. The uh, uh, owner of the building received a report, thought there must be some kind of science behind it and quickly forwarded on to the banks and insurance company. Um, and then the dominoes started to kind of kick in. So I had a terrible example where um, the, report, uh, the initial assessment report came through, I forwarded it on, didn't really pay much attention to it, that's what it, it is what it is only to find out a year later when I brought an engineer through that, in fact, the assessment was based on a three-storey building, but my building was on a slope. It was actually a five-storey building, so just wildly inaccurate. So my first bit of advice is really to actually understand what your seismic rating is. Don't rely on what's been given to you by the council. They've only got a limited budget and limited time frame to assess all, all the buildings. So the first thing you need to do is actually get it assessed yourself so you understand what you've got because you may have given the wrong information to your bank or your insurance company or your tenant um, and it may be not as bad as you were thinking. So the other thing that happened is that because it, the whole country faced this tsunami all at once, the engineers were completely inundated by people ringing and knocking on their doors and we really don't have the level of expertise or the number of engineers with this experience to be able to deal with the inquiries. So it would be similar to if the government passed the rule that everybody needed to get new toilets, you call the plumber, he's not going to answer the phone because he's got a hundred other people trying to get a hold of him. So my experience was the level of service you got from the engineers went downhill because they were swamped by work, they didn't have to really work that hard for it, I'm sorry to say. Plus, um, because they were so busy, you tended to get work pushed down in the organisation, so you had more junior engineers, so maybe they've just graduated, and actually produced um, engineering designs that were just completely impractical and price, you know, uh, completely out of uh, reality. Uh, the worst one I had was a, a young engineer at a big firm uh, presented me with a design for a building that had a huge solid concrete wall right in front of the lift doors. So you couldn't get to the lift. So, uh, you know, it was just, you know, so it's, it's taken me quite a while to find an engineer that we can work with. 
Um, they tended, and I'm not an engineer, so they tended initially to try and strengthen the buildings um, and maybe over-engineer them. And it seems to me, from a layperson's point of view, they're now being a little bit more pra pragmatic and the buildings are um, um, probably not as stiff as they were trying to do. Um, so, and the process actually takes qu quite a while, even though it's been a period since it's uh, legislation's come in, the, the engineers are still so busy that even with a good relationship you might take a year or more to get an engineering report. So, um, and everybody who leaves it till the end is going to be knocking on the same door. So the sooner you start this process, uh, the sooner you'll actually understand what it is you've got now. So it's not, a, in my mind, it's not critical right now to know what it is you're going to do to be able to strengthen it is actually what what do we actually own and give and then of course find out what it's going to cost to strengthen the building get the engineering done for that and then you know where do we go from here do you know if we've got a tenant in place can this work be done with the tenant in place um, what the hell do we do if it's vacant and we've got this building so um, you know, I, I would start the ball rolling. Don't uh, think that because one engineer has given you a report that that's 100% that's the only option you've got. You might find that different engineers give you different options. And I I've, I've certainly had that on um, Postel. What we, what we ended up doing, we started with another engineer who got a bit nervous about uh, Omru Stone. Uh, what he designed initially wasn't what we ended up doing. So um, get, the, get the ball rolling, really. So the other thing I would say, which is kind of a more of a generic, a generic type of um, topic, really, is that the concern for people will be, if I spend this money, how am I going to justify the cost? And am I going to get a return on this investment? And I see recently the Environment Court, there was an appeal taken to the Environment Court, which uh, said that just because you can't get a return on investment and um, to warrant spending this money doesn't give you the right to demolish the building. So um, the commercial argument, if you've got a uh, historic building, is, you know, it's, it's, it's a really difficult one. So I'd also, you know, looking at Omru in general, try and, maybe I'm shooting my own self in the foot here, try and lobby the, the council to say, you need to put some protection in place for the streetscape of Omaru because there will be owners that will say, it's just too damn hard. I'm just going to knock it down and I don't really care. You know, just, I can't deal with it. But if people start doing that, you end up with what's happened in Christchurch, which is it's just, you know, so difficult having these vacant sites all over the place. Or if people just decide, well, look, I've never been able to tenant the first floor. All I need is the first floor for retail. I'll just knock, I'll just take the first floor down. And suddenly the whole streetscape of Omaru is changed. And in years to come, people will be going, gosh, it looks so much nicer before. Now we've got car parks in the middle and we've got, you know, we've lost our, 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 our town, really, you know, our, our streetscape. So the, I don't think there's any bylaws in it now. You can demolish buildings if it's permitted. But I'd, I'd actually be, as a community, saying to the council, you've got to try and put in some bylaws which protect the streetscape, even though it's going to be a bloody nightmare for building owners. Uh, because once it's gone, it's gone, and, and and you lose the heart of what you've got, and you, what you've got is pretty pretty amazing. And these are buildings that some people will say, well, they're not really that significant. You know, they're built in the 1940s or 50s, and not historic. You know, but it doesn't take much. You know, look what Countdown's just done to that corner of that whole town. You know, you know. So I don't know what was there before, but if you if you're not careful, you'll end up with you know, a real messy kind of town that's really lost its heart. So that's my five cents worth.